We were at our, in the house that we were staying at, and he got the phone call, and he just happened to mention again, very un characteristically, this kind of, you know, they called me and told me I had the Medal of Honor, something like that. He was mama. Said, what do you mean you had the Medal of Honor? Classmates, my buddy from, what, what, what's going on? What's the phone call? And I guess the way he, the way he tells the story, I said, well, I'm going to give you the Medal of Honor. And I never had, I never had ever thought about the Medal of Honor with anybody. And that kind of shook Crestwich up. He jumped off the top bunk. He said, you dumb son of a bitch, you know what that is? <laughs> First Lieutenant Raymond G. Murphy, United States Marine Corps Reserve. We view with almost uh, uh, incredulity the tales that we hear told in these citations. It seems impossible that human beings could stand up to the kind of punishment they receive and deliver the kind of service they have. President Eisenhower's first year in office, naturally uh, you got a lot of activity when you get, you go into the White House, all your family, and it's a big deal. You got seven people getting the medal, you got seven families from seven different parts of the United States, and it's very emotional. Well, I'm very proud of it. It's very, very important to the history of the country. Born in 1930, Raymond Murphy, or Jerry as known by friends, grew up in Pueblo, Colorado in the 30s and 40s. At a young age, Murphy discovered his natural talents for sports and developed into a standout athlete at Pueblo Catholic High School. He developed a strong sense of community and the importance of family and friends. And his strict Catholic schooling was the foundation of his discipline and leadership skills. His childhood lessons of physical strength and strong mental attitude laid the groundwork for his entire life. It was these attributes he would rely on later to rescue his wounded Marines. Murphy's exceptional ability on the gridiron earned him a college scholarship. He and his best friend, Jack Krasovich, decided to attend Fort Lewis Junior College together. Later, they completed their four-year degrees at Adams State College in Alamosa. It's a friendship that has lasted a lifetime. We knew each other from since we were youngsters. We went through the same schools. We were, we were teammates in high school. We had the same kind of upbringing with our, with our parochial background and our church and being altar boys. People talk about discipline and uh, that's the first thing they learn in the Marine Corps. I think we already went through boot camp. We went through almost 12 years of parochial school and we had tremendous discipline and that's a credit to the nuns to be able to control the situation and not let you get out of hand. And in addition to that, don't forget, we learned that we had a very good background with our home. The Korean War had broken out in 1950. A year later, the Marine Corps casualty rates among lieutenants was high. To beef up the ranks, the Corps offered college graduates an officer's commission upon the successful completion of boot camp at Paris Island. Murphy was faced with the draft after graduation. His brothers, both World War II veterans, encouraged him to take advantage of the officer's program. As they had in the past, Murphy and Krasovich made a go of it together. They had a crash program to get Marine officers. It was the biggest uh, class of officers in the history of the Marine Corps, and there'll probably never be another one. It started out at a thousand. We never were much on weapons. So I just barely made the, and if you didn't, there was a chance if you didn't make the qualifying at the rifle ranges, you might get bounced out of the program. Uh, I was having a hard time. I was having a very difficult time. And qualifying day, I missed expert by two points, and I don't know why. Somebody up there saw the need to help me. <laughs> Every Marine is a rifleman. That's where they teach you the basis of being a Marine and bring a, being a Marine officer and to be a leader, and that's what we're there for. And as being a leader means that you got to take care of those folks that are assigned to you, your platoon, your company, whatever it is. As General Schwarzkopf said, think about this for a minute. When you're a platoon leader, whether it's in the Marine Corps or the Army, it's the only time in your life you have the direct command of 45 individuals. You know them by their first name, you know them by their last name, you know their hometowns, you know their parents, you know everything about them. In 1952, the war in Korea was being fought at the 38th parallel. 
the Marines were in desperate need of second lieutenants. In three days, Murphy was on a plane and on the front lines. I was scared, uh, foreign countries, you know. But after uh, six months on the front lines, and I had changed considerably. Murphy was steadfast about the safety of his men. He took every precaution to reduce casualties. To the point at one time, he was convinced his protective actions would result in a court-martial. Even though Murphy maintained an extreme level of concern for the lives of his men, he understood the importance of maintaining some distance. I tried to not get too close because I'd heard some bad things. And one was a friend from Minnesota that had gone through this program from Paris Island to Quantico and to Pendleton. And within two months or three on the front lines, they had to ship him back because he broke. And he broke because he got too close to some men that got killed. The first one I lost was a boy named Mendoza. And it bothers you. It's very hard. As another frigid Korean winter began in late 1952, the worn troops were growing weary of the terrible living conditions. Living in the ground, caves. A cave with a log and sandbag roof, rocks. You put a lot of rocks on top of sandbags on top of the wood, mainly to detonate any kind of incoming that might come in. It's a dirty existence, animals you're living with, you know. Well, it's not, not a very sanitary or clean. There's no glamour in war. No matter what anybody says, no matter what kind of movie that you see, it's not glamorous. You make do with the best you have. And I think anybody who's ever been in war is going to tell you maybe the same thing. It's there, you've got to put up with it, you've got to do it, and you've got to go forward. And it'd be the first one in the world to tell you it was frightening. Every time the sun came up, thank God, and every time the sun went down, there was a lot of action going on. Throughout January 1953, Murphy and his men made practice runs for an assault on the enemy-infested Ungak Hill Mass. Named Operation Clambake, they ran through the simulated raid until they could almost do it blindfolded. The main idea was to, from the United Nations down, it was to hit their strong points. And Ungak was one of the strongest points. The main mission was the assault, destruction, intelligence, prisoners was a heavily reinforced company with mortars, machine guns, the planes and stuff we had, and artillery. I would say overall the whole operation probably involved maybe 1,500 people. Execution of Clambake was based on two age-old military principles, faint and surprise. The diversion was a tank attack on the Kumgak Hills, while Murphy's company would perform the surprise infantry raid on Ungak. The Chinese were getting entirely too comfortable on Ungak, and a comfortable enemy within a thousand yards of the main line of resistance was unacceptable. The 1st Marine Regiment, which I was in, was scheduled to come off the line. When you're on the front lines, we called it the line. Uh, and uh, the 5th Marine Regiment was to take over our spot. Just so happened that his battalion replaced the battalion I was in, his company replaced the company I was in, his platoon replaced my platoon, and we exchanged Greetings. Well, we were there a couple of hours shooting the breeze, and I really think, I think we had a beer. Somebody found a beer for us, and we had a couple of beers, or maybe one, something like that, and that was it. Took off and said goodbye, and they took over the positions that we had. Qu really coincidence, isn't it, that we known each other since grade school, he replaces me, and I take off, and he's there. Same spot that I was in. The Chinese had been building. They'd that's all they do, they would dig day and night. A buddy of mine that came up to get a 50 caliber, Jack Kressovich, he said, that thing's like Gibraltar out there. It's crazy trying to get that, and it was. It was like building a bunch of apartments in the mountains. Murphy had been due to rotate from Korea on January 31st, 1953, just two days before Operation Clambake. But knowing about the upcoming mission, he volunteered to stay with his men. But it was just two days more for the operation. So I stayed. Kind of felt like I couldn't very well leave the troops I had, really. 
As the day of operation approached, the Raiders made their last-minute preparations. Corporal Leandro Dominguez, who had already been awarded a Silver Star and three Purple Hearts for earlier action in Korea, stood ready. I used to communicate with my dad quite often, you know, and uh, I thought about asking him for a flag, you know, and uh, for an occasion like this, you know, and 3rd of February was it. When we went, we were in going to the line of departure into no man's land. I remember we, they stopped us for about 15 minutes and uh, so we could have more daylight. It was a real winter morning for sure. The rice paddies were full of ice, you know, and uh, very cold. It was cold, but we were perspiring. And, and I guess nerves, that's what it was, you know. I was, uh, 17 at the time, and I grew fast. Lieutenant Murphy's platoon was uh, assigned to evac, stayed behind, and we went up two hills, and he stayed in the hill in the middle. He was uh, swarming with communists. They were in a mood to fight, too. When we got into their trenches, they were surprised. They were going back and forth, and I noticed uh, a lot of them were going into like a hole, you know, and the hole came up like a cone. And uh, we threw hand grenades in there and they didn't go off, they went off way down. Afterwards, we examined the holes and to the sides. They used to get in and, and stay to the sides and the hole was down, you know. So they were well protected and well, well planned. The surprise tactics of Clambake worked to perfection. The hill was set ablaze with napalm and artillery, while the infantry drove the enemy out of their own trenches. After we secured their trenches, before they reinforced, we were planting flags. I pulled my flag, that was my biggest wish, to put uh, a New Mexico flag out there on their trenches. I figured I'd let the communists know, where, let them know my presence there. We, we were set in, in their positions, but when they gave us a word to withdraw, that's where coming back, that's where we really got the casualties. And we were stuck over there trying to withdraw. Thank God Lieutenant Murphy uh, defied orders and went up after us. Sensing the assault had stalled and knowing Marines might be in trouble on the hill, there was no holding Murphy back. After about four hours of around 10 or so, I knew something was the matter. We weren't getting anything back. So I took a group of, I don't remember how many, it wasn't very many, two or three guys, and went, walked up to the top. And uh, it was a mess. It was really a mess. Uh, my main mission was evacuation, but the thing switched, switched because of what was happening up on the hill. The mission had to automatically change or else you, you, you leave everybody there to die. And so on his own volition, Jerry Murphy took his platoon and began to go up against the hills. This was without order. This was because he sensed Marines were in trouble and he was not going to leave Marines in trouble without doing everything he could. Right away started trying to organize things to get because I knew we had to get the wounded out and I, there was nobody, no sergeants, you know, officers around that I could see. I just realized that we had to get, start getting the people back. It was going to get dark and it would be worse. You got to always concentrate.